Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom on this very cold, and yes I can see my breath on the air, October evening. As you may have noticed, behind me is my brand spanking new polytunnel which I built earlier this summer. I finally got round to editing all the footage together and this is the video in which I'm going to show it to you. We're going to go back to the very beginning and I'm going to talk you through the entire build step by step minus a few of the boring bits I hope. So if you're interested in putting up one of these yourself and you want to see how it's done then stay tuned. Firstly though I want to tell you about my greenhouse, the greenhouse that is no more. Because in that first year that I moved here I built a greenhouse just up there uh, near my caravan and I chose that location because it was in full sun from dawn till dusk. But it was also very exposed and sadly I had just one season of growing things in that greenhouse before the beast from the east struck that same winter. Suffice it to say my greenhouse was sent flying in pieces all over the surrounding fields and I still have neighbours to this day finding chunks of corrugated plastic in their hedgerows. The lesson I learned all too well was that if I ever built a greenhouse or a polytunnel again it had to be in a sheltered location because what use is full sun if your greenhouse blows away? And even more importantly, it had to be really, really strong. So when I was researching polytunnels last year, I found a company in the UK called First Tunnels. And there's a link to their website down in the description. And they allowed me to customize the design for strength, adding things like these lateral bars on both sides, which make the tunnel virtually stormproof. But most polytunnels you buy wouldn't have features like that. And to my great surprise, they very generously offered to give me this tunnel. Though quite honestly, I would have bought it from them anyway, as I was determined this time around, after what happened with my greenhouse, to build something really high quality that was going to stand the test of time and actually improve my ability to be self-sufficient here at Mossy Bottom. And one huge benefit of being gifted the tunnel was being able to spend the money which I'd saved on the inside. It allowed me to buy in really good quality soil and build raised beds, which I wouldn't have otherwise been able to afford. But before we get to that tour which I promised you, I want to take you back to the very beginning when this site was little more than mud and weeds. So my polytunnel is 14 foot by 40 foot. Uh, and this is the site which I chose to build it on, which is one of the lowest parts of my land uh, and that's why with the help of an incredible friend um, I raised the level of the ground by about 50 centimetres uh, which is about a foot and a half, something like that. Uh, and that's a process that actually took weeks um, but I had the soil having excavated a lot of um, ground to create hugel mounds for my strawberry plants, about 250 strawberry plants. Um, so it was just a case really of moving it from the top of my land to the bottom in a few hundred wheelbarrow loads. No diggers were used, uh, it was entirely done by, by man and woman power. And another reason to do that was that it allowed me uh, to level the ground here. And I think one of the mistakes uh, people often make when um, erecting a polytunnel is not taking the time beforehand to make sure that the site is flat. If you don't do that, it means that some hoops are higher than others, uh, nothing is quite square, nothing quite lines up, which of course is going to, um, to compromise the longevity of that structure, uh, as well as being a right royal pain in the bum to actually put together. Um, it's also really important if you intend to build raised beds uh, inside the tunnel, as you will see later in this video. So it took me a while on that glorious day at the beginning of May to get uh, everything unpacked and ready to go. Uh, Moss was uh, a big help as ever. The delivery was also a challenge um, through no fault of the of the company or the delivery driver really but it arrived in a huge arctic lorry uh, which of course couldn't make it down my my dirt lane, my boreen. So I had to drive to a lay-by a few kilometers away which was the nearest place the driver could actually pull in with his lorry uh, and then I had to ferry all the parts back to Mossy Bottom by car 
Fortunately, a very kind neighbour of mine, that most of them are around here, um, lended a hand with his transit van. Otherwise, I'm really not sure I'd have been able to fit the longer parts in my little Nissan Micra. The next stage was to mark out the corners of the tunnel the old-fashioned way with a measuring tape and a bit of trigonometry. My tape measure wasn't long enough to cover the diagonal length of the tunnel because it's a really big tunnel, so I divided the space into two smaller rectangles, as you can see. Now you need to do this in order to make sure each corner is 90 degrees. If it isn't, then the structure won't be square and you'll really pay for that later on uh, when you come to put the hoops up. I then had two 14 by 20 foot rectangles and to calculate the hypotenuse or the diagonal, um, square each number, which gave me 196 by 400, add them together, which gave me 596, and then just calculate the square root of that, which was 24.4. And that is the diagonal length of each of those rectangles. If you don't want to do the maths, there are calculators uh, online in Google where you can just type the numbers in of each length and it'll work it all out for you. And what you're trying to do then is make sure that both diagonal lengths are identical. And if they are, you're good to go. If you're putting up a tunnel or a greenhouse or any structure really, I can't emphasize enough how important it is um, to make sure it's square. Even Moss, as you can see, is taking this seriously. <laughs> the next stage was to measure and place the foundation tubes along the two longest edges of the tunnel. Mine is a nine hoop tunnel, uh, meaning there are 18 tubes in total, nine on each side um, at equal intervals. And having placed them, it was finally time to get my hands dirty uh, and do something I'm pretty experienced at at this stage digging holes. So I opted for a tunnel with buried anchor plates, which provides extra stability uh, in windy locations, which it certainly is here. A lot of polytunnel providers don't offer options like that, uh, but first tunnels actually have five foundation options to suit your location and budget uh, for a timber base. That's one, a concrete base, uh, screw anchors for the soil, um, and of course the anchor plates, which I opted for, as well as of course, just the foundation tubes. If you live in a sheltered location surrounded by houses, uh, for example, then you, you probably don't need to worry uh, about storms quite as much as I do. My priority was not losing this tunnel like I lost my greenhouse. So each hole is 50 centimeters deep, about a foot and a half by 40 centimeters wide to accommodate the plate at the right depth. So the swaged end sits level with the top of the soil. You could backfill these holes with concrete if you wanted, uh, but because there are so many on my tunnel, I didn't consider it uh, necessary. And concrete has a very high carbon footprint, so personally I try and avoid using it as much as possible. The weight of soil alone is so much that uh, the plastic membrane of the tunnel would tear uh, before the tunnel lifted off the ground anyway. So. If we ever had a storm that bad, uh, I don't think it would be an issue. But be sure to stamp them down just to be on the safe side. The trickiest part with the base plates is keeping them at exact intervals. If you stray even by a few centimetres, then your hoops will be wonky, as I discovered uh, with one or two later. Digging 18 holes half a metre deep takes a while, uh, but mercifully I had some help with the other side, and we just kept going right the way into the night, as you can see. The following morning, all base plates were in, uh, and after a final clean-up of the ground, removing any loose stones and levelling any uneven patches, it was time to lay the ground sheet. Now, the soil underneath is absolutely riddled with weed seeds. Uh, and it may not look it in the video, but that's just because they haven't had a chance to germinate yet at this point. A ground sheet which can be supplied with the tunnel completely eliminates the weed problem. A mistake people often make is laying the ground sheet after building the tunnel. If you do it first like I did, then you won't have any loose edges or gaps uh, where the weeds can find a way up. You also won't have to mess around um, cutting it. Once down, I tightened it up and then poked holes um, where each of the anchor plates sat 
to hold it in place. And you can see I have a little overlap on the outside edge of the tunnel, which I temporarily weighed down with timber. It's a great thing to have that overlap um, or excess because it keeps the outside weeds away from the plastic. And of course, if weeds grow up on the outside of the tunnel and touch that plastic, they're gonna cause mold and mildew to grow and they're gonna cause discoloration of your plastic. Having laid the ground sheet, it was then time to start assembling the hoops. Definitely the most exciting part of the entire build. Now each hoop came in three parts and it was simply a case of slotting them together and then adding a bolt at each joint for strength. When you buy a prefabricated tunnel like this, um, everything has been thought of, which makes it a lot easier. The cabin, which you can probably see in the background, was completely bespoke, built partly from trees on my own land, uh, which of course is enormously fun because you get to creative problem solve everything, but it's also a lot more time consuming than buying something that's pre-made. Thankfully, I had a helping hand with this process because as you can see, uh, it's a tricky thing to manhandle these hoops on your own. Um, but once you get them in place though, it's, uh, it's as easy as pushing them down into the swage tops of the, um, the anchor plates. As long as you've got the anchor plates in the right position, that's really important, then the alignment and the tension of each hoop will be perfect. In all, it took less than an hour to put the hoops up, uh, and I think doing so transformed the site to something that, for the first time, actually looked like a polytunnel. I remember being very excited at that stage and also realising quite how big this tunnel was going to be. So the next task was to fit the brace rails, which run along the joints of the hoops from one end of the tunnel to the other. So as you can see, I assembled them on the ground first and then began the process of attaching them, initially following the joints precisely until I realised there were some minor differences in height from one hoop to the next. Uh, which is fairly inevitable, even if you're as precise as I was. But that did mean I had to make a few adjustments as I went. And I should say an average polytunnel would not include brace rails like these, but I wanted them for added strength, knowing just how windy it can get here. They also help to brace the plastic, which really reduces sagging. Finally, the ridge pole, which is just the same process as the brace rails. The only tricky part is you have to stand on a ladder to attach it because of course it goes on that top joint in the hoops. It's definitely easier with a helping hand uh, because one person can hold the pole in place while the other tightens the bracket. I had to make a few adjustments again at the end as my first hoop was leaning out slightly and the ridge pole is exactly 40 foot. So there's zero margin for error. Again, we made use of every last drop of sunlight that May evening, I remember it well. Next were the corner stabilizers, very straightforward to fit. Not a lot can go wrong with these. They're just diagonal braces, which stop the hoops potentially blowing over uh, if you have a strong wind, which hits from one of the door ends. And then came the door rails. Again, easy to fit and necessary for supporting the wooden doors, which are coming up. Use a spirit level to make sure the door rails are sit square, otherwise your doors are going to hang at an angle or scrape the ground as you open and close them. In my experience, 50% of building structures is making sure everything is square, which in an environment like this does require a bit of lateral thinking. Finally, in terms of the steel, we have what's called the storm stays. And these are small brackets which give the joints on the hoops even more strength. This is the sort of feature you wouldn't find again on every polytunnel, but it makes a huge difference uh, to longevity in storms and bad weather. And now folks, we're onto the doors. And first tunnels give you three main options when it comes to doors. A single door, a double door, which is what I opted for, and a sliding door. You can opt to have them uh, at both or only one end. I went for both as it's such a long tunnel and I actually need access at both ends. Now all the wood is pre-cut to size, which makes it a whole lot easier, um, but this is where I did encounter my first real snag with the build. Some of the wood had got wet between it arriving uh, and me assembling it, and had then dried in the sun over several days that May. And as a result, it had warped quite badly. 
That's just what timber does if it goes from being wet to dry in a short space of time. So please don't make the same mistake I made. If you're not assembling the tunnel immediately, then store it somewhere completely dry and don't leave the timber out in the sun during the build because there's a real risk it will warp. I had to buy some replacement timber and cut it to size um, as it's really important that your doors, yep, you guessed it, are square. Otherwise, of course, they won't meet in the middle, the latches won't fit properly and they'll just look really bad. I had four doors to make, two for each end, so it was a lot of screwing and hammering um, as each joint needed a nail plate for added strength. But of course, when you buy a prefabricated polytunnel, every step of this process is explained in detail. Um, although that's not to say you could do this without at least some basic DIY skills and tools. So the next step was to pre-assemble the frames which would support each door. I think there were actually 10 inch nails, uh, like something unearthed from an archaeological dig. I've never used nails that big before. But of course a screw that long would be really tough to get in, uh, at least without a good impact driver or a very strong arm. The hinges go on, having checked that everything is nicely aligned uh, and the gap in the middle is just right. And now for the covering. So all polytunnels need ventilation and one of the configuration options is to have ventilation along the lower sides of the tunnel, which if you live in a hotter climate uh, is really valuable. But I opted to just have ventilation in the door panels, which is kind of as standard, uh, which you can see I'm now fitting along with the first pieces of polythene on the doors. And if you purchase a good quality polytunnel like this uh, and assemble it correctly, then the first thing to fail will un undoubtedly be the polythene. It does stretch in the wind and eventually it'll become uh, irreparably sun damaged. This stuff is 200 micron plastic, is 20% thicker than uh, the average polythene covering for a polytunnel. And it has a five year guarantee. You're probably not gonna find better than that realistically. Once stapled down, I added some more strips of timber to hold it in place. And then I just repeated uh, the same process on the other side. And I have to say, when it comes to the doors, uh, that's the easy part. <laughs> Next came some more digging, my favorite activity. Uh, so having pinned the ground sheet back, I then had to dig a trench along the exact line of that gable wall. And this was necessary to bed the lower part of the door frame into the ground for stability. And you may be wondering why not just put um, a bar or a piece of timber all the way across and use that to support the frame rather than burying it. The problem with that would be that you'd create um, a ridge making it hard to go in and out of the polytunnel say with a wheelbarrow uh, which would potentially be a trip hazard. This way there's nothing to step over. My paracord came in very handy at this point for maintaining that line across the bottom uh, and once I got the position just right, it was time to cut the pieces of timber at the top, which are intentionally oversized uh, to give you some room for maneuver. I then fitted the brackets, raked back the soil, checked the doors, opened and closed as intended, uh, and went and had some lunch. <laughs> that was a hard job to do alone, I have to say. Alas, there was no help that day. Next came the fitting of hotspot tape along the outside edges of all the steel which will come into contact with the polythene. And as you can see, my volunteer at the time uh, did a great job with this. The purpose of hotspot tape is kind of revealed in the name, I think. It's to stop the metal abrading and damaging the polythene due to heat and contact. If you're home building a polytunnel to your own design, don't forget this stuff or the lifespan of the polythene will be drastically reduced because that's where it'll fail first. And while my able volunteer was doing that, I was attaching the timber base rails uh, along the bottom edge of the hoops. And the purpose of these is to provide an anchor point uh, for the polythene shell. You also have the option to bury the polythene in the ground. And I think many people do do this because it's the cheapest option but it's harder to get it tight if you do that. Not to mention all that extra digging, um, and I frankly had done enough digging at that point. 
Next, a fun little job was fitting the latches and locks on each door. The two at the bottom slot directly into small metal tubes which you insert into the ground, and I thought that was ingenious. So at this point I decided to focus on the inside of the polytunnel, building the raised beds and filling them with the soil before adding the polythene, because that way I could use the sides of the tunnel uh, between the hoops for access in and out. Always thinking ahead. The raised beds aren't part of the prefabricated polytunnel, I should say that. I bought the lengths of timber myself and made them to my own design. They're 30 centimeters or 12 inches deep, uh, any more than that is, is wasted on vegetables, really. You could probably get away with just 9 inches, to be honest. And I'm just using uh, lengths of 1 inch spruce attached to posts and hammered into the ground for stability. I assembled the sides first, joined them together to prevent the panels um, bowing out with the weight of the soil, and then hammered them into the ground, directly through the ground sheet. Finally, I added some thin pieces of timber to keep the two panels locked together. Do you need raised beds in a polytunnel? Um, well, no, you certainly don't need them. Raised beds are easier to work in because you don't have to bend down quite so far, and they tend to warm up a bit quicker in the spring uh, than the ground beneath. But you absolutely could, and many people do, plant directly into the subsoil in your tunnel, just like I do outside. And then came the fun job of shifting yet more soil, 116 wheelbarrow loads in total, yes I was counting, all moved by hand in order to fill up the raised beds. The biggest one being in the middle, which I hadn't yet constructed at that point. And the soil is pre-mixed and steam treated to kill any weed seeds, uh, with mushroom manure added back in for fertility. The main reason I bought it though, rather than using my own soil, was to keep the weed seeds out. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, one year of seeds, seven years of weeds. Well, if you can avoid any seeds from the very beginning, um, you're at a huge advantage. So at that stage, back in late May, we had a week of windy days here in the west of Ireland. Uh, and the next and final job, of course, was attaching the polythene cover. So I remember going back to working on the cabin for a while, waiting patiently for the next windless day. The polythene needed to cover a tunnel of this size, believe it or not, is sufficiently heavy that I couldn't safely carry it on my own. So I knew this was not going to be easy, even with the Irish weather on my side. When that day did finally come, I once again had the good fortune of an extra pair of hands, and the first thing we did was set about unfolding the polythene alongside the tunnel. And bear in mind there was very limited space to do that as I, I don't have a lawn. Within a few meters of the tunnel um, there are yet more vegetable beds so it was a tight squeeze. And then the polythene had to be lifted onto and over the hoops. Which probably watching it on screen appears relatively straightforward. Uh, but please believe me when I say this was physically the hardest part of the entire build because um, as one end was lifted, the other dropped down again, the middle constantly sagged, the dreaded sagging, and it was incredibly heavy, more than it looks. We were also standing on ladders, outstretched as we pulled, uh, but we did get there in the end. I remember collapsing on the grass after that. If you're doing this on a large tunnel as well, I'd really recommend having three or four people. It would have made it a lot easier that day. And after several hours recovering, <laughs> it was time before that wind picked up again to secure the polythene in place. And this involved a lot of pulling to make sure it was as tight as we could get it. Sagginess is your enemy, as we've already established, so we took our time doing the top of the door frames on either end first, and then the timber base rails along the sides. And once pulled tight, you simply hammer on a secondary piece of timber, uh, which locks it in place, all supplied with the tunnel. Finally, the tricky bit, securing the polythene to the door frames. And this is all about technique. Again, don't attempt this by yourself, or you'll make a pig's ear of it, as my dad would say. What you need to do is pull the polythene tight and then stagger it in even folds so you don't have a huge excess at the end. 
line it up and get it all fitted before you secure the pieces of timber uh, which lock everything in place. And then the really fun bit, which alas I didn't record, you get to cut all the excess plastic off and reveal hopefully a perfect polytunnel. And here she is a day or two later, yes it's a she. If boats get to have a gender then I don't see why polytunnels shouldn't. I have to say I was delighted with the end result. Um, there were a few snags along the way, mostly my own fault. Um, that's to be expected though with a build like this. Nothing went disastrously wrong, thanks honestly to a really high quality product, very clear instructions, um, some helping hands and of course a bit of extra help from the, the weather gods. The only thing left to do at that stage was plant some seedlings grown in modules uh, in my mini greenhouse that spring and more than ready at that point to plant out. We have squash down the middle interplanted with perpetual spinach, parsley, basil and aubergines or eggplant uh, along the right side, tomatoes and beetroot along the left side and a few little extras here and there like a grapevine Sweet potatoes straight from the shop, that was definitely a, a last minute experiment. Uh, oregano and even a few dwarf sunflowers for added colour. Not to mention, of course, a wind up radio and a comfy chair, which I'm sitting in right now for those rainy days best enjoyed in the quiet, contemplative company of plants. Of course, it's the middle of winter right now, um, but here's a flashback to how things looked in my tunnel that July. Some things did better than others. Because the tunnel wasn't finished until the end of May, the tomatoes and the squash just didn't have a long enough growing season. So it was a small crop. But this year, 2021, I can start them much earlier. So I'm really excited for that. The biggest success was actually the aubergines, which were both uh, huge and plentiful, and according to my volunteers, tasted far superior to any aubergine they'd ever bought from a shop, which I have to say I think is true of all homegrown vegetables. Alas, that's just about it for this video. For anyone out there thinking of buying a polytunnel, I hope it's giving you the confidence to have a go at assembling it yourself, um, or at least the appreciation that you might need to get someone else to do it for you. <laughs> Either way, if you want to grow heat loving crops which need to seed, like tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, pumpkins, squash, aubergines, then in a cooler climate like in Ireland or the UK, a polytunnel is a great thing to have and much cheaper than a greenhouse. But if you just want to start out growing vegetables, uh, potatoes, carrots, broccoli, kale, peas, beans, all these things can be successfully grown outside. So if you can't afford one, or if you don't have the space, don't let that put you off getting started growing food. It is one of the absolute joys of life, seeing a seed with nurture become a crop that you can eat. And it's so empowering to produce food yourself, rather than depending on uh, the supermarket to keep you alive. This year I'm planning to make a whole series of videos following the entire growing process from germination to planting out, caring for and harvesting uh, from my polytunnel. I'm really not an expert, this will only be my second season growing undercover, and the first was kind of a half season because I started so late. Um, I do have a lot of experience growing outside, but this is going to be a learning process for me too here in the tunnel, but one which I'm really excited to share with you. For now though, thank you for watching, subscribing and supporting the channel. Here's to 2021! and all the fruits of our labour yet to be reaped. I can't wait. Bye for now.